Hello everyone, in this video I'm going to be talking about IAM core concepts. This video is aimed at anyone just getting started learning about AWS, and even for some of you that are more experienced but struggling with IAM fundamentals. I'm really going to simplify a lot of the concepts here, but at the same time I'm going to teach you what you need to know to use AWS effectively with IAM. So let's just jump right into it. And at first, I just want to talk quickly about some core concepts here. Uh, so first of all, what does IAM even stand for anyways? Well, it stands for Identity and Access Management and is what I would consider to be one of the core AWS services. And its function is that it helps you control access to resources. Well, naturally, we would ask, what is a resource? Resources are the entities that you create in AWS. So for example, an S3 bucket or an S3 object. There's a whole bunch, there's a million different resources that you can create. You can create Lambda functions, you can create DynamoDB tables, but IAM is the thing that allows access or guards access to those resources. Now from a user perspective, well, users attempt to perform something called actions, which look a little something like what we have on the right here. So S3 create bucket. There's a whole bunch of different actions and they're scoped to particular AWS services. So for example, this is one that gives you the ability to create a bucket. Now authorization to perform an action depends on something called a policy. And a policy is just basically a JSON document. We're gonna look at one a little bit later on. And it specifies what a particular user or role for that matter, can and cannot do in the context of AWS actions. So it's basically a list that specifies what the user um, has permissions to do on AWS. So if you are with me so far and you understood these four lines, this is basically like the core concepts of AWS. If you got it, then fantastic. Then the next slides are gonna be easy. You're gonna get it even more. If you didn't, don't worry about it because we have a whole bunch of examples that we're gonna go through. So let's take a look at a quick example to demonstrate some of these concepts in action here. So let's assume that we have a user, say it's me, Daniel, and I'm trying to access a particular resource. Uh, say for example, it's a Lambda function in AWS. And I want to call a particular API. I want to perform a certain action on this particular Lambda function. I want to create a function. So create an instance of my Lambda function. So the next question is, how is access to Lambda's create function even determined? So how do we specify whether or not Daniel has access to create function? Well, if you have a brand new user account here and you don't specify any permissions, then when you try to perform this action, you'll get an access denied error. If you're familiar with AWS, you're probably quite familiar with access denied errors. And if you're not familiar with AWS, get prepared to be familiar because you're gonna see them quite a bit. So that's what'll happen if you don't have permission to do something. But how do we actually correct this? How do we give Daniel or user here uh, permission to Lambda Functions create function API? Well, we need to craft a policy document and attach it to Daniel in this case. And this is what a policy document looks like. Now there's a couple things that aren't really useful here. And by the way, this is a very, very simple, probably the simplest policy document that you can build, but it demonstrates a lot of these core concepts. So at the top, we see version. It's just some arbitrary date that no one really knows why it's that particular date. And then we have something called a statement. A statement is, uh, you can see it's an array, so we can have multiple different statements. And this is really the meat of the policy document. It tells us what we are allowed or not allowed to do. So if we look inside that a little bit further, we see something called SID or SID. And it's just a, a name that you can give your policy statement here. You can name this whatever you want. Now the next three items are the actual important stuff. So the first one is something called effect. And we are saying that our effect here is allow. Now there's two possible values here for effect. It's either allow or deny. So the fact that we're using allow here means that we are giving away permission. So anyone that has this policy document is going to get permission for whatever actions that we specify next. Now we can also set this to deny. Deny is saying, you know, if I give this to a user, then I explicitly do not want this user access to this particular action. Now, while we're talking about denies, just a very quick sidebar, there's two different things in AWS when it comes to denies. There's what is called an implicit deny. An implicit deny is when you do not specify allow permissions to do something. So for example, in the first case here, when I was talking about the fact that Daniel will get an access denied error, the reason I would get that was because there was an implicit deny. I didn't have access to create function, right? No one gave me access. It's implicit. Right? So the way AWS works is that you always need to be explicitly given 
permissions to do things. Now there's varying degrees of permissions. It could be all the way down to the resource level, but you always need to have explicit allow permissions. So that was implicit denial. Now there's something called explicit denial, which is when you actually put deny in the effect statement here. And that is saying specifically, I do not want this user access to this. Now, why is this useful? Well, sometimes you give some pretty broad uh, policy documents, like give someone access to all of S3, but maybe later you want to tack on, like give them access to all of S3, except for S3 delete bucket or delete object, for instance. So back to what's in this policy document here. So we're saying allow here. And then below that, that's where we're specifying our Lambda action, which is in this case, Lambda colon create function. Uh, so that is the specific action that we need to create our function. And then that last statement here, uh, this is a little bit of a can of worms, but the resource section is usually meant to limit the scope of this action. So for example, it doesn't really apply here for create function, but for example, if we had update function here, then we may only want to give update function permissions to a specific Lambda function that we have, maybe like foobar function one, two, three. If we wanted to do that, then we would specify the ARN of that particular function. Don't worry if you didn't get that, I'm gonna talk a lot more about this in the upcoming slides. So assuming that you have this policy document associated with this user, if you were to try and call create function, then you would be able to do it, which is good for us. Now, before we move on, I want to quickly touch on three different ways you can interact with AWS to, for example, create a function. Now, regardless of which way you choose, permissions to perform an action are always evaluated against the policy document that's associated with the user. So there's a bunch of different ways that you can create a function, right? The most simplistic way, probably what most of you that are just learning AWS are used to, is through the AWS console. So when you sign in as a particular user here, you can see in this particular example, I'm signing in as a user named AWS simplified underscore user. Well, that user is scoped to these permissions, right? So when you log in, AWS knows that there's a certain policy document associated with this user, and that's gonna limit your actions in the AWS console. So that's one way that these policy documents are applied. Now, the other way is through the CLI or the AWS command line interface. This is another way that you can create functions. You can issue commands through the CLI to say, go ahead and create a function. That's the second way. And the third way is probably what most of you will be doing when you actually build your applications, and that's programmatically using the AWS SDK. So using whatever language uh, that you prefer, you can use a corresponding SDK to call APIs, such as create function in this case. Now in either cases, in one, two, or three, AWS needs to know who you as a user are and what the policies that are associated with that user. So how does it do that? And to answer that question, I want to take a very brief detour to talk about something called access keys and secret access keys. So access keys and secret access keys are secret codes that you use to interact with AWS. When you create an account or someone creates an account for you and you log in and you go to the IAM section, you can get access to two string values, what is called the access key and the secret access key. These are just basically alphanumeric um, strings that I think are like 16 digits long or something uh, that you should keep very, very secret, but they are kind of your username and password, so to speak, when you're interacting with uh, AWS programmatically. So let's take a, a look at this in action. So what are the options to use the secret access key? Well, first of all, when you're a user, you don't really have to worry about this because like I mentioned before, when you log in, AWS knows it's you, you've provided that password, and therefore you have access to whatever is in that policy document. Now let's say you're trying to interact with AWS through the CLI. How does AWS know that you know it's you or it's me, Daniel, and like what permissions this person has? Well, when you first use the AWS CLI, you need to configure it. And when you configure it, like you can see here, it asks you for your access key and your secret access key. And you can kind of see the tail end of both of mine there. So that's how it knows who you are. And when you try to run an API or an action, it's gonna evaluate that against your policy document to see what permission you have. And if it does, it'll let you through. And if it doesn't, it'll throw an access denied. Now the third way, and probably the most common for most of you, will be programmatically. So if you're using a language like Python, this is what it looks like. So you can see here, we have a Lambda client. We're using Bodo3, which is the SDK library. We're creating a Lambda here, and we're passing in a AWS access key ID, which is a constant, and then our secret access key, which is also a constant. 
also doing some other stuff with region, and before finally calling Lambda client create function. So those are the different ways that you can use your secret keys credentials to interact with AWS, and the policy document is evaluated when you are trying to perform certain actions. So I just wanted to take a quick detour just to recognize this point here. So let's move on now. And the next thing that I wanna do is just take a little bit of a closer look at a policy statement or a policy document. You'll hear these terms, they're generally used pretty interchangeably. So let's take a look at one that will give DynamoDB read-only access to specific columns. So I'll just say that again. So DynamoDB read-only access to specific columns. So let's take a look at this and see what it looks like. And I want to grab my pen so I can draw on this really quick. Okay, there we go. All right, so, um, you know, ignoring what we have over here, we're seeing this is an effect allow, which is good. Uh, we got some actions here. These actions are, you know, we have batch get star. Uh, by the way, you can put asterisks in here. Asterisks are wildcards. So if you have different things like batch get item, batch get something else, um, this line item here may... Uh, kind of encompass multiple different actions by using this kind of notation here. So it's a quick way uh, to give like a little bit of a shorthand. By the way, you can also do like a star right after DynamoDB. So like put a star right here and that'll give DynamoDB all access. So if you want all access to all APIs for DynamoDB, that's what you would put here. But you know, that's not what I'm going to talk about in this example. And we also have get item, query and scan. This is great. These are four very common read only operations. And then um, remember from our previous example for resource, we had star here, right? And star was an indicator for, you know, basically wildcard, anything, so to speak. But here it's a little bit different. We are giving away access to a particular table for this read policy. So this is the notation generally that you'll use. So we're specifying the ARN, uh, then AWS here, and then DynamoDB. And then these two, I think it's either AWS account number or region, I can't remember. Um, and then, you know, it's the other one. So I can't remember which comes first, but regardless, uh, it's both of those things. And then we're specifying the table and then the name of the table. So in this particular policy, I'm giving away access uh, for, you know, batch get item, get item, query and scan, but they only are scoped to this particular resource. So this kind of gives you the best of both worlds, a access based access control, uh, which is on actions and a resource based access control where you can specify the resources. Now down below, like this section here, I don't really expect anyone to really know what's going on here. Uh, but I, what I do want you to know is that you can use something called conditions. Oops, I don't, didn't really mean to cross that out, but this says conditions here. And conditions are basically constraints that you can apply to your policy document depending on context. And there's a whole variety of different condition keys and condition operators. Uh, I believe these are, are condition operators and then these are condition keys here. Now, I don't expect you to know kind of what's happening, but I'll tell you what all this means. Basically, what we're saying here is that for this particular policy, I want to limit its scope such that all values that are returned based on any of these uh, kind of query operations up here are only applicable for certain column names of this DynamoDB table. So column name one, column name two, and column name three. And then this thing down here is basically saying that we're limiting access to specific attributes and which specific attributes. Well, it's these columns that are named right here. So that's what's going on here, but I don't really expect you to know what's happening. I just wanted to kind of show off some of the functionality that's possible when you're using some pretty complex uh, policy statements here. Uh, now, I wanted to talk about some other important concepts. These are some kind of optional things, but things that I, I think you should know about. Uh, now, the first one is called groups. Now, groups are usually only relevant for uh, like account owners or organization owners that are kind of managing the AWS account. But what groups uh, allow you to accomplish is to bucketize your users into certain themes. So you can see in this example, we have three different groups, one for admins, one for developers, one for test. And what these groups allow you to do is to assign a default policy document so that anyone that has membership to a particular group automatically inherits 
those policies that are associated with that document. Uh, so it's a really great way to kind of standardize your process to assign policies and permissions to users. All right, and the second one that's important to know about is something called the roles. And I used a uh, construction hat symbol to kind of symbolize the meaning of roles. Now with users, it was clear. We, we generally, um, a user is a person that is using the AWS account or the AWS credentials. But roles are kind of similar to a user in the sense that they have policies associated with them, but they're kind of interchangeable. Like, and that's why we have the construction hat. They're interchangeable in the sense that you can share them, you can assume the role, you can give it away, you can have access for only a short period of time and not after that fact. So they're generally used when you want to give temporary credentials that are limited in scope to perform a certain function and then after a certain period, take it away. So who actually uses roles? Well, that can either be a user. So you can give a user the ability to assume a role that has a certain permission set, for example, to access a DynamoDB table, for example. And then you can also have an application such as a Lambda function be given the ability to assume that role so that it in turn can also access a DynamoDB table. So both software applications and users can be given permissions to assume these roles and roles have policy documents that may give away access or restrict access to certain resources. Now, finally, the third one is something called trust relationships. And what trust relationships solve for is a scenario like this, where you have two different accounts. Say you have account one and account two, two different AWS accounts uh, that you correctly separated by ownership. Maybe there's two different teams in the same company that both have their own accounts. And say you're stuck in a scenario where account one has a DynamoDB table and then you have a different user in account number two that's, you know, maybe they're, they're a user or maybe they're a software application that needs access to that table. So how do we how do we do this? How do we give this user in this other account programmatic access to this DynamoDB table? It turns out there's a couple steps. The first step is that for in account one, we need to create a role that has the policy document with permissions that we want to give this user access to. So maybe it's a read only role or something like that. Now, the second thing we need to do is that we need to establish a trust relationship. And a trust relationship is something that you do through IAM. And a trust relationship is kind of like a full duplex, I trust you, you trust me kind of thing. So account one needs to say, I trust account two. And account two needs to say, I trust account one. And at the same time, account one needs to give account two's user the ability to do something called assume role. And assume role is basically saying, I'm giving this particular user the ability to wear this particular hat. And this particular hat happens to have DynamoDB permissions. So that's what trust relationships are. It's a very common occurrence where you need to uh, kind of split things up and access stuff that is across account. Uh, and I just figured this was worth talking about. All right, so those are some other important concepts that you should probably be aware of. I wanna move on now to talking about just some pro tips that I've accrued over the few years um, using AWS and IAM that I wish people told me about earlier. Now, the first one is that you need to protect your root account at all costs. Now, the root account is the account that you use to sign into AWS with your email when you, were, when you originally registered for AWS. And it is what is considered a special account. It's a special account because it can revoke access to any other account. So any other like user account that's created in that account, um, the root account is kind of the master, the top level node, so to speak, that can revoke, uh, can give away, can do anything it wants on that account. So you really, really, really want to protect access to it. Also has some uh, unique functionalities that only the root account has access to. It's another can of worms, don't want to get into that. But basically, um, for your day-to-day -day activities, create a user in your account that you know has their own login credentials and programmatic access, and just use that for your day-to-day. -day. Don't be logging in and using your root account uh, for your day-to-day -day tasks because you may you know accidentally give away credentials. Who the heck knows what can happen? Just don't do it. The second one is about policy documents, and it's that the explicit effect deny will win over effect allow. So what I mean by this is that say you have a policy document with two different statements. One is S3 create object allow, and one is S3 create object deny. In this case, the deny always supersedes the allow. So even though these two things conflict with one another, the deny will always win. 
This will save you some headaches when you are trying to debug why you don't have access to something. The third one is something I kind of touched on before uh, when I was talking about resources and wildcards, and that's to use the least privilege model. The least privilege model is the notion that you should give the least amount of access to resources that are required to perform that particular job function and no more. So always specify resources, always specify specific actions. Don't go all willy nilly using wildcard stars all over the place uh, because you'll put yourself in some situations that can lead to hot water later on. And my final tip for you is to use something called policy simulator when you're trying to debug uh, problems with your policy statements. This is something that's offered through AWS and it integrates directly with your AWS account. So you can see over on the left there, I have a couple different user accounts um, that are selectable. And what you can do here is basically select a service and an action and see if you have access to that combination. And if you don't, the tool will tell you which part of the policy statement is preventing access to that particular resource. So super, super handy when you have some really big um, policy documents and you're not really sure where this is going wrong. I assure you it's a very useful tool from a debugging perspective. Now, finally, I just want to kind of recap everything in a couple sentences here. Uh, so let's go through this really quick. So we create users who use credentials. And as a reminder, credentials can be uh, looking like something like this, where we pass it in programmatically or through the CLI that grant access based on their policy document. And as a reminder, this is what a policy document looks like, a very, very simple one at that uh, for Lambda functions. And then we create roles, which are interchangeable, which can be assumed by entities and entities can be either a person or a software application within or across account boundaries with a trust relationship. And as a reminder, trust relationships are I trust you, you trust me kinds of arrangements. So as a next step, you should watch the video on the right to see me create a policy document and attach it to a user in action. And if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe. I'll see you next time.